Now that most boards are interested in a diverse pool of people, people are starting to say, well, how do you make sure it's a meritocracy, right? And my retort to that is you are assuming it's always been a meritocracy. And you're assuming everyone who is on a board today is actually the best in terms of experience. It used to just be who people in the room knew. And that was a very limited population of individuals, mostly men, who were put on boards. The only time I've ever heard the term, we need to take a risk on someone, is when it refers to someone who is different than ourselves. I'm Patrick Pacheco, and you're listening to season four of In Good Companies from Cadence Bank, the podcast where we share our wealth of knowledge to help you navigate the opportunities ahead, because that's what Cadence is all about, the expertise and flexibility to do business on your terms. We're empowered to help, whether it's through our podcast or any one of our more than 350 locations across the South and Texas. Imagine a boardroom, a fancy one, lots of glass, probably a great view, a long table stretches to the middle surrounded by sleek office chairs. But who's sitting in those chairs? You'd be forgiven for picturing a bunch of men. In 2023, less than a third of all board members of companies in the SP 500 are women. But things are changing, fast, and in no small part, thanks to our guest. My name is Anna Catalano, and I'm a board director based in the U.S. outside of Houston, Texas. Anna has spent the past two decades perfecting the art of board governance. Fortune Magazine named her one of the most powerful women in international business. And that might be understating it. Very few people in the world know more about boards than Anna. Over 20 years, she has sat on a dozen public boards. And what's more, she has made it her mission to lift up new talent as well. Together, we'll discuss effective governance and why diversity is essential, both in the future and right now. As it turns out, one of the key functions of a board is actually representation. What I tell people is a board represents everyone who can't be in the room. Our primary role is to represent people who have invested in the company, people who have bought stock, people who invest in private companies, people who have invested in companies, and in the nonprofit world, people who have donated to organizations. People who can't be there are represented by a group of experienced business people who understand um, how business should be run in terms of strategy, in terms of organization, as well as in terms of culture and how an organization should feel to work at. So in addition to people who invest in organizations, we also represent other stakeholders who also can't be in the room. And that includes customers, it includes employees, it includes communities, everyone who has a stake in the existence of that company and the impact that it has on various audiences. Our role is to oversee how the organization works We oversee strategic options when companies have decisions to make regarding growth and capital allocation, how they spend their money, where they spend their money, do they go into new markets, do they go into new countries. Hopefully you've got voices around the table who are experienced enough to contribute to that conversation and can help the CEO and their executive team make those decisions. Over the last decade, finding the right voices has become a focal point for directors. And while there's still work to do, Anna says that a shift is underway. Well, I think we've made a lot of improvement in adding different voices to the table over the years. I mean, since I started my board career over 20 years ago, on many of the early boards I was on, I was the first woman or the only woman on these boards. I've been on boards now where 50% of the directors are female. The advantage there is that The more different perspectives you have around the table, the better the conversation and therefore the better the decision can be. It can be pressure tested in a lot of different ways, a lot more ways than if you had people who had very similar backgrounds. And as you increase the diversity around the the table. And in this particular situation, we're talking about gender. You increase the likelihood that someone's going to come up with a question or a perspective that others around the table don't have. And that's tremendously valuable as you consider options in a very, very complex business environment. 
it seems like they've come a long way, but still a need to continue to, to increase gender equity and, and maybe even just, just diversity in general on boards. It's important, I think, to know how boards get selected. How does that occur and how does that work in favor or not in favor of, of having more diversity on boards? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's important to understand how it all happens, right? So what usually happens is in a board meeting, a group of directors will sit around and say, hey, we need to think about what our board looks like down the road. We've got so-and-so who's going to be rolling off either through a tenure decision or personal reasons. They, they're they not going to stay on the board. And there's an opening that's going to exist. And the first question is usually, here are the skills that we're, we need to look for based on what the company is trying to do. Who do you guys know? I get phone calls quite a bit that say, hey, I've got a search and I really need to look for some more diversity candidates that have these skills. Who do you know? Because they know that in my circle, I know a lot of people who are different. So the first group of people that's important to know you are a group of directors that are sitting around the, the table. So that's always the first way the conversation goes. After people accumulate a list, they will then usually move to the, the conversation of, okay, how do we expand this? And we usually go to search firms that have people that specialize in board placement. And the search firm then says, okay, what are the skills you're looking for? Who do we have in our network of people that we know that we might be able to put forward? Most boards these days will say to a search firm, we want to make sure that we have a diverse slate of candidates. So please make sure that the list you give us is a diverse slate. And that could be gender, it could be people of color, it can be geographic background if a company is a global company. And that's how we get the names. 20 years ago, recruiters didn't know people that were that much more diverse than sit people sitting in boardrooms. But now, recruiters have an incredible database of people who are board ready, as we call it. And there are a lot of organizations that they can connect with organizations like National Association of Corporate Directors, NACD, Women Corporate Directors, WCD. There are organizations out there that are filled with people who are board-ready individuals who represent diversity. Boards are diversifying across many fronts, gender, race, and age, to name a few. But change isn't always straightforward. All in all, I think most boards are interested in making sure that the room represents a diverse pool of people. So people are starting to say, well, how do you know? Do you need to take a risk? Are you lowering the bar? How do you make sure it's a meritocracy, right? How do you make sure everyone who's on a board is qualified if you're just, if you're looking for diversity? And my, my retort to that is you are assuming it's always been a meritocracy. <laughs> and you're assuming everyone who is on a board today is actually the best in terms of experience. And I would venture to say that in many cases, that's not the case because people have chosen people they know. And it used to not go to recruiters. It used to just be who people in the room knew. And that was a very limited population of individuals, mostly men, who were put on boards. And actually, I find it interesting that the only time I've ever heard the term, we need to take a risk on someone, is when it refers to someone who is different than ourselves, right? I would say that by virtue of going to greater diversity on boards, you actually have made it more of a meritocracy. So do you have a number of people who are qualified to sit on boards that haven't been considered that are female and people of color? Absolutely you do, absolutely you do. I don't worry at all that anyone has had to lower a bar um, to increase diversity on boards. One thing that stands in the way of board diversity is unconscious bias. That's something Anna has experienced firsthand. Absolutely. And I, you know, I've got a, a story that I'll share regarding unconscious bias that happened to me years ago. So when I started my career, uh, my ethnic background is, is Chinese. My parents were immigrants from China. And um, when I grew up, I, I learned to speak Mandarin. And so when I started my career with my company, I made it very well known and clear that if the company ever um, had opportunities in China um, that I was suited for, I would love to. I would love to to go. And so, in 1994, at the end of 1994, my company was looking to open up a downstream refining and marketing office in China. And when a group of individuals got together to think about who they wanted to to put on this job, a meeting took place, and there were a group of people. They were all men in this room who were talking about, okay, who should we send? 
And from what I hear, the conversation went like this. Somebody said, well, we should send Anna. She's always wanted to go and she speaks Mandarin. She totally suits the role. We should send her. And someone else in the room said, oh, she'd be outstanding. But Anna's expecting her second child. There's no way she'd want to go to a developing country with a new baby. So we need to think of someone else. And so the conversation moved on until somebody interrupted and said, you know what? I think we need to ask Anna. Okay. And sure enough, they asked me and I told them as long as my child was born healthy, I would be willing to go three months after, you know, they were born. So I tell that story because the person who initially said she wouldn't want to go because she's pregnant was not someone who was deep sixing my career. This was not someone who didn't like me and didn't want me to have the opportunity. This was someone who had a bias that basically said no woman who is pregnant would or should go to a developing country. And if it was my wife or my daughter, I, I don't think I'd want them to go. And so he was making that statement, actually not to harm me, but to look out for me. To combat your unconscious bias, you have to interrogate your assumptions. I don't think there are many people who get up in the morning and say, I'm going to go to work and make life as difficult as I possibly can for women today. There may be a few, but there are very few. I think that people sometimes don't realize that the assumptions they make regarding other people may not be correct. And so I often wonder what would have happened had that second person not said, I think we need to ask Anna, because I may not be speaking to you today, Patrick, I may not have become a director, right? So those are all opportunities. And so what I tell people is, when you experience unconscious bias and you hear it happening, it's so important to call it out. I call unconscious bias out sometimes in, in board meetings myself. In a, me a board meeting not too many years ago, I remember hearing people talk about succession and it was a manufacturing company and they were talking about potential future plant managers and they put up a list of potential future plant managers. And I said, are there no women on, on this list? Because they were all men. And they said, yeah, there is one woman, but she has a family and she probably wouldn't want to work the hourly schedule. And I said, wow, that's really interesting. So none of these men have families. <laughs> and you could have heard a pin drop, Patrick, because that, that's one way to get into the conversation uh -huh. is to make people realize they are making an assumption on women that they don't make on men. And by the way, I think it is equally unfair to assume all men are willing to do what the job entails, because that's also an assumption, isn't it? But Anna also believes that solidarity against bias is more and more common in the world of corporate leadership. Growing up in the oil industry, it was not a women's world. It was a man's world. And I would say that during my executive career, the majority of my mentors were men because they recognized that I had something to offer. They recognized I had a skill and were going to help open doors for me. And I would say the same thing exists in the world of boardrooms today. There are as many men opening doors for women and people of color as there are women. And, you know, those of us who have gotten to board level appointments recognize how much work it takes to get here. And women have, you know, unique challenges that exist. I mean, we're, we're the only ones that, that have children. And during those childbearing years, sometimes, you know, we've got other things that we're focusing on. And those of us who've been through that understand that. The women that I know work tirelessly to help other women get on boards. They're turning around on the ladder to, to reach down and help others come up. But I know a lot of men who do the same thing. And so, you know, hats off to people who recognize the true value of diversity in a boardroom that help open doors for women. At Cadence Bank, we're here to help the people and communities we serve prosper. We have the understanding that comes from listening to your needs and the expertise to make it happen. Find out why Cadence is the bank for you. Visit CadenceBank.com to learn more. Cadence Bank, member FDIC. While the doors to boardrooms are beginning to open up, getting a seat at the table is still a game of patience. You have a blog called Shades of Leadership, and you, you talk about this a bit. And maybe give us your thoughts on, on board refreshment. Board refreshment is one of my favorite topics these days because everywhere I turn, I see opportunities. I think there is a structural issue with many boards that needs to be corrected. And that is that when people are assigned to boards or appointed to boards, oftentimes they feel as though it's like a Supreme Court appointment. You're on until forever. 
And um, I think that's wrong because I think companies deserve to have a good group of people sitting around the table who are all contributing and all bring very different perspectives. So I recently, uh, last year, stepped down from a board that I served on for 16 years and was a large cap board. And a lot of people say, why would you ever step down from a from a, a board like that, you know, that size of company? And I said, because it was time. It was time for me to go. I, I had served on it for 16 years. I'd been through four CEOs. It had been through a huge merger that changed the makeup of the company and the strategy of the company. But it was time for me to move on and time for new people with new experiences to offer their expertise to that company. And when I left, there were people on the board who had been on longer than me. But that wasn't my decision. That was their decision. But I think it's important for boards to always look at their board makeup to say, do we have a good balance of historical knowledge of a company and fresh ideas. Because if a board gets stale, it's not good. I think it's actually important for boards to have evaluations on directors. I think it's important when people join a board that they are told and they understand that the reason they're on is because their skills are valuable to the chapter that company is going through at that period of time. And at some point in time, we might move to another chapter and we might need other skills. And I'm constantly looking at my boards and saying, am I actually offering, am I the best person? You know, one of the best people to, to be at this table, because if not, I need to make room and there's other things to do. So where this conversation has to begin is what is the company hoping to do and hoping to accomplish in the next five to 10 years, right? Therefore, what are the skills we need around this table in order to help us get there? I always tell CEOs that their board of directors are their cheapest group of advisors, and there should never be a challenge that a company comes across that someone around that boardroom hasn't experienced, done, um, seen, lived through, because if, if that's the case, then you have the wrong people sitting around the table. While more companies are realizing the value of diverse governance, getting onto a board as a woman still isn't easy. There's definitely a generational shift happening. And so I think there's tremendous opportunity. I think that what women need to recognize is that the media hasn't done us any favors. There's a lot of talk about board diversity. We need to get different people on boards. And so there are very unrealistic expectations that some people have that they think that it's easy to get on a board because boards are looking for women. And so I think that that's quite a challenge. What women can do is understand how it works, which I explained earlier in terms of who makes these decisions and become what I call top of mind when it comes to people who are in a position to recommend names and to put names forward. You need to make sure that you are one of the first three people they think of. Networking alone is not enough because when you network, you are going to an event, passing out your business card, getting to be known, and that's what you do. This goes far beyond networking, and that is investing in relationships with current board directors as well as recruiters and making sure they think of you first. The second thing I think is, is very important is to make sure that you've got a narrative that truly is distinctive about what it is you do better than anyone else. So if you are a financial expert, that's not enough because there's thousands of you out there. Think about what it is in particular about your skill that makes you different. Are you a financial expert in global issues? Do you focus on one part of the world? Are you a financial expert in mergers and acquisitions? What are the things that make you truly special that your voice would be the best voice to have in the room and make sure the people who put names forward know that about you? So it's like I say, it takes an investment in time. It's like any other relationship you have. Just because people know you is not good enough. I think that if you are a former CEO or CFO, you've got an easier role because a lot of boards actually look for those two specific titles. But if you're anything other than those, like people like me, you actually have to really network and make sure people know who you are. Some recruiters out there are some of my closest professional friends. They know me and it's because I've invested time in getting to know them and I keep in touch and I do things for them and help them find people. That's how business works. 
And I think you have to be willing to do that because there's way too many people that are sending their resumes to recruiters these days, and there's no way a recruiter can remember everybody. Getting on a board is a career goal that you carve out through time and experience. So if you want to be a director, you've got to educate yourself. That's especially true for women. I think that there are still people who are concerned about the fact that a lot of women have gone up in the ranks through functional roles and not roles that have profit and loss responsibility. In many corporations, you will find more women in human resources, financial, marketing, communications, PR, and you won't find enough women who've actually been on the sales plant management operations side of the business, the side of the business that actually generates the revenue. And so make sure you spend time out in the field. Make sure you spend time with people who are in the operations, pulling in the revenues, that you understand how the business works overall. It's not to say if you're not if you're deep in an area, you're not going to be of value. In in fact, in many companies, they look for depth in certain areas. But you still need to be able to read a PL. You still need to be able to understand workforce legal issues about governance. You still need to be able to understand as many pieces of a company and an industry as you possibly can. Because when you're in the boardroom, you're not just there because of the role that you had before. You're there because of your business knowledge and your business expertise. That might mean going out of your comfort zone. I'm a real believer in multiple chapters in a career, probably because I had to create mine. And um, there are a lot of opportunities where people can make sure they are absolutely board ready. National Association of Corporate Directors has a certification process that is, is second to none. People can learn about all of the different aspects of being a director and what people need to know in order to hit the ground running on day one, especially in this day and age where we've got a lot of functional experts that are joining boards these days, whether they are technology people or HR people or um, financial people, directors do a whole bunch of things that are outside of those purviews. When you become a director on day one, you are liable for all of the things that all directors are liable for. So if you don't know anything about what directors should be concerned about, you better before you're in that room. I started my career in oil and gas, and I started with a company called Amico based in Chicago. And my area of expertise was retail marketing. So I was on the very, very close to the customer side of the oil business, which is different than most oil people. So one thing that I did when I when I started my role in, as a board director is I actually asked my recruiter friends, do me a favor and keep me out of oil and gas for a while. I'm a marketing and salesperson. I spent my career in an industry that didn't know how to spell marketing. See if you can find a board for me that is in a different industry because I want to learn too. And I want to be around people who do different things. And so, you know, I was, I got put on the board of a chemical company, a consumer products company, financial services, insurance. I was not afraid to step out of my industry comfort zone and say, I'm willing to learn about infant formula, right? And I've learned so much about business in general as a director, learning about other industries and other businesses that I couldn't possibly have learned if I'd stayed in in one company my whole career. So I came into banking from law, and there was times we'd be in a meeting and everybody's talking about handling something a certain way, and sometimes you just ask that real practical question about, well, why don't we just do X? And everybody kind of looks at you like, oh, sometimes people that are in industry get tied into the way things are done and somebody from the outside can look at it and say, well, that doesn't make sense. What about this? And you have that aha moment that a new director could could bring to to the table. Well, and again, I think therein lies an advantage of diversity, isn't it? How much industry expertise do we need in the boardroom? Because if you're running a chemical company, you're surrounded by experts in your executive team that run a chemical company. And if you have a couple of CEOs that are in that industry, that's probably enough. And you probably want to think about some other perspectives, especially as complex as business is getting these days, there are so many industries that actually need to look outside of their industry to learn about how things are going to get done. I, I love being that voice that that says the one 
crazy question that causes people to say, oh, yeah, right. We never thought about that. I, I find that I play that role quite often. The more I listen to Anna, the more I get a sense of what good leadership means to her. It means collaboration, learning from each other, and maybe most importantly, getting your hands dirty. The most fun I've ever had on a board, I, I will say, is when I get an opportunity to go with the board out into the company and meet people at the grassroots level of the company doing the work. I love having offsite meetings. I love plant tours. I love going to other countries and meeting people in R&D facilities in Asia. I, I love going out and, and feeling the pulse of what the company is doing. And so for me, those have always been the best times when as a group of directors, you not only feel like you're adding value, but you're really learning and you're, you're getting context that will help you in future meetings. So, you know, when you sit in the future in the boardroom, you all had that experience of, ah, this is what it felt like when we were in that plant in Sweden and looking at how this was being done, right? So those are, to me, the best moments. The worst moments are always, in. it's like in any organization you work in is when people are spending time dealing with politics and ego. And boardrooms are not free from the politics and ego zone, which is why it's really important to choose a board based on whether or not you really like the people. I mean, I, I have always made it a point if I am coming into a new board that I want to meet everyone who's sitting around the, the table because I want to know that this is a group of people I can trust, that it's a group of people I can respect, and a group of people who, when crisis happens, and it always does, this is the group that I want in my foxhole. Ultimately, boards are about people. Directors have to understand the company stakeholders, both inside and out, so they can represent their needs, their interests, and their efforts. Directors are people, incredibly talented people, but people nonetheless. They may be limited by who they know or how things have always been done, or even unconscious bias. So if you're a leader looking to enter the boardroom someday, Think long-term, invest in relationships, educate yourself in governance and industry, and don't be afraid to dive right in. If you're a director, open the door for others. A great board is a mosaic of personalities and skills. The more diversity you have in the room, the more fruitful the conversation. Bringing new faces to the table is a necessity. If you work to help others, your career won't just be successful, it will be meaningful. You know, a career in board service is a real privilege. You get to work with some brilliant, brilliant people and you get to learn. So I would encourage people who are starting their career to just get as good as you possibly can. And, you know, down the road, um, when that opportunity comes, I hope it happens because it's been the most rewarding part of my professional career. I'd like to thank Anna Canelano for sharing her insights and for opening the door for a new generation of experts and leaders. I know they will rise to the challenge. Do you want to hear more In Good Companies? Of course you do. Rate and review the show so we can bring you more episodes and even bigger guests. It only takes a second, so pause the podcast and do it right now. I'll wait. Still waiting. I haven't got all day here, guys. Let's go. In Good Companies is a podcast from Cadence Bank, member FDIC, equal opportunity lender. Our production team is Sheena Cochran, Edie Pingeli, and Natalie Barron. Our executive producer is Danielle Cornell. This podcast is made in collaboration with the team at Lower Street. Writing and production from Andrew Gannam and Lise Lavati. Sound design and mixing by Ben Crannell. This podcast is provided as a free service to you and is for general informational purposes only. Cadence Bank and its affiliates make no representation or warranties as to the accuracy, completeness, or timeliness of the content in the podcast. The podcast is not intended to provide legal, accounting, or tax advice and should not be relied upon for such purposes. The views and opinions expressed by the host and guests in this podcast are solely their own current opinions regarding the subject matters discussed in the podcast and are based on their own perspectives. Such views, perspectives, and opinions do not reflect those of Cadence Bank or any of its affiliates or the companies in which any guest is or may be affiliated. The production and presentation of this podcast by Cadence Bank does not imply the expression of any opinion on part of Cadence Bank or any of its affiliates.